Thank you. Thank you, thank you. My name is Wayne Dyer, and um, I'm 72 years old. And, uh, and I have sex almost every day. Almost on Monday, almost on Tuesday, almost. Anyway. <laughs> that was Jack LaLanne's opening for 20 years until he was 94 years old. So I borrowed it from him. My mother passed away uh, two days ago. And, um, and I didn't... Um, I mean, she was 96 years old and, um, and in a coma the last few days of her life. Uh, but it's, um, it's an interesting passage. Um, I thought it would be, uh, I remember my introduction to uh, a different kind of psychology was brought to me by uh, a man named Abraham Maslow back in... Uh, 1962, and, <clears throat> and I was fortunate enough to be able to study with, uh, with Dr. Maslow, and, and he really introduced me to a, uh, a different way of, uh, of looking at how to help people and how to improve the quality of our own lives. It was a turning point for me, and one of the things he spoke about uh, were these people that he calls self-actualizing people, which if you remember Maslow's pyramid and the hierarchy and you go from your basic needs to the very top of the pyramid, the very top of the pyramid is uh, something called self-actualization. And he described um, self-actualizing people, one of the flaws of self-actualizing people is that they... Uh, is that they get over death almost as if it didn't happen. Um, they have an awareness within them that, um, that nothing dies, that everything that um, materializes, of course, changes form. But um, there is something, my teacher in India, his name was uh, Swami Muktananda, many of you have read. and. Um, he was asked the question, what is real, Master? What is real? And Muktananda said, that is real, which never changes. Everything else is illusion. So I've been looking at, um, I've been thinking about Muktananda and, uh, and thinking about Dr. Maslow, who uh, passed away on the 7th of June, 1970. That was the same day that I was walking across the stage in Detroit at Cobo Hall, receiving my PhD, um, in almost the same hour. It was as if he had said to me, I've explained this whole idea of self-actualization to uh, the academic world. Now you explain it to the cab drivers <laughs> and the school teachers and the nurses and the yoga students and everyone else. This whole idea that there is a, that there is a higher place where each of us can reach right here while we're here. And I've been thinking about all of this uh, since my mom left. Um, and there's pictures of my mom uh, all, over my, uh, all over my apartment on Maui. I have pictures of her on the wall uh, when she was 10 years old in 1926. And another picture of her reading a poem that she wrote when she was uh, 12 years old in 1928 about the election that year. Any of you remember the election that year, <laughs> 1928? Smith or Hoover, who will it be? 
Both are running for the presidency. <laughs> Smith is the thin one. Hoover's the fat. My, such an uproar. Where are we at? <laughs> that was my mom at 12. And I have pictures of my mother at uh, 30. And I have a picture of her sitting on my lap on her 75th birthday. And um, I look at that pictures and I say, which one of them is my mother? <laughs> Was she that 10-year-old? Um, according to Muktananda, that is real, which never changes. And all of us are here in bodies that we believe is who we are. We're totally convinced of it. I was in a 21-year-old body, and I can't find any part of it anywhere on the planet. <laughs> but while I was in it, I was absolutely convinced that this is who I am. And, and then I moved into another body, and another body, and another body. And the same is true for each and every one of us here, that there is some part of us that is infinite, that is the soul, that is the spirit. It makes, makes no difference what you call it. Um, many of you know that I wrote a book um, about seven years ago after living the uh, Tao Te Ching for a full year. It's called Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life. And I took each of the 81 verses of the Tao Te Ching and I took a full year. I began on January the 1st, 2005, and I read verse 1. And I would take four and a half days, four days to contemplate it, think about it, meditate on it, try to understand it. And then um, in the half day that I had, I would look at a painting of Lao Tzu from 2,500 years ago, and <clears throat> someone had channeled this painting and sent it to me from, uh, from my radio show, and I don't uh, do any writing now without him looking at it, and I just sort of gaze at this uh, drawing that this person imagined Lao Tzu to be, and um, it speaks to me. And I would write an essay the Tao Te Ching, some call it the wisest book ever written. Someone once sent me a copy of a book called uh, Jesus and Lao Tzu. And on the left-hand side of the page were all the sayings of Lao Tzu. And on the right-hand side of the page were all the sayings of Jesus that mirrored what Lao Tzu had said 500 years before his birth. Now, I'm not saying Jesus was plagiarizing but I am saying there are eternal truths. And these eternal truths came to me directly out of the Tao. And I did this for each of the 81 verses of the Tao. And the opening line of the Tao Te Ching says, the Tao that can be named is not the Tao. As soon as you try to define this invisibleness that is within each and every one of us, that keeps occupying these new bodies all the time while the body continues to change, who we are is infinite. So I wrote a few words out about what I think of as the soul. Let me just share them with you. The ideal of the soul, this part of you that is um, never changing, this part of you that is infinite. And that word infinite is a very important word to think about because um, it's the opposite of finite. Finite means something begins and ends. If it didn't end any place or didn't begin any place, we wouldn't be able to call it finite. We would say it is always continuing. The minute that it stops, the minute we have a form to it, the minute we place anything on it that, uh, that is associated with this physical corporeal world that we all live in, 
um, it moves from the infinite to the finite. So to try to define that which is infinite with a brain or a mind that is finite is an impossibility. Lao Tzu knew this and understood this. It's why meditation is such an important part of the uh, process of, uh, of coming to our highest self, coming to know who we are. It's the place where there are no beginnings. Herman Melville once said that God's one and only voice is silence. Is silence. It's the one place where there's nothing finite there. And Blaise Pascal, the famous uh, French philosopher and scientist, once said that uh, all of man's troubles stem from his inability to sit quietly in a room alone. But most of us just aren't comfortable with this because we have come to believe and trust in the evidence for who we are is on the basis of that which we can touch and see and feel and smell what our five senses tell us. But our five senses lie to us. William Blake pointed that out beautifully in one of his poems back in 1777. He said, to see the world in a grain of sand, in a heaven in a wild flower, to hold eternity in the palm of your hand, and infinity in an hour, we are all led to believe a lie when we see with, not through the eye, which was born in a night to perish in a night while the soul slept in beams of light. We are all infinite beings in a temporary human experience. I've said it over and over again, whenever people ask me what's my very favorite quote, my very favorite observation, it came from Pierre Tellard, the French priest who was excommunicated from the Catholic Church for his outrageous ideas. He said that we're not here as human beings having a spiritual experience. It's the other way around. We are all infinite spiritual beings having a temporary human experience. And coming to a place where we live our lives from that infinite place and beginning to know our soul, it's one of the reasons why I accepted an invitation to come here. Um, I do yoga myself five, six times a week. Um, I know the significance of it for me in my own body, in my own health, my own life, my own emotional state. I know that when I meditate, I'm better. I know that when I do yoga, I'm healed. And, um, and so I came. So getting to know this, the soul, the spirit, and not identifying ourselves on the basis of our, our physical senses. It's the essence of my newest book, um, which is a PBS special, called Wishes Fulfilled. It's the whole message behind all of it, is to really come up with a specific way to, um, to come in contact with this infinite part of ourselves. Now remember, if it's infinite, it doesn't stop any place. It doesn't start any place. That's by definition infinite. So if something doesn't start and doesn't stop, what is it doing? It has to be expanding, doesn't it? The minute it stops expanding, it's finite. We're no longer talking about the soul. We're talking about what Blake said, we've become, we, we see with, not through our eyes. So here's what I jotted down. The ideal of the soul, the thing that it asks for, is neither knowledge, nor light, nor happiness. The ideal of the soul is space. 
immensity. The one thing it needs, more than anything else, is to be free to expand and to reach out and to embrace the infinite. Yet the ideal of the soul is infinity because that's what the soul is. It is miserable when it is circumscribed or restricted in any way. Now, I have um, eight children, six beautiful daughters and two sons. And um, one of the things that I know, I used to say that uh, before I had children, I had eight theories about how to raise children. <laughs> and now I have eight children and no theories. <laughs> All right. But one of the things I know about children is that no one likes being told what to do. And this isn't just children, this is all of us. One of my favorite songs is a song from when I was back in high school. Oh, give me land, lots of land, and the starry skies above. Boy, you know it. <laughs> Don't fence me in. Don't restrict me. Don't put, don't put boundaries on me. Don't tell me what I can do and what I can't do. Don't tell me how to be there. Don't tell me what to wear, what to think. Don't tell me how to, even how to do yoga. Don't tell me I don't want to be told. This is the soul speaking, always. The soul is constantly having a desire to expand and grow. And anything or anyone that comes into your life that attempts to do that, you will find yourself fighting it and reaching back. Particularly will you find this in, um, in your yoga practice. Yoga, the word yoga means what? Union. Union with what? your highest self, union with God. This is what the highest self is. It's the part of you, the place within you, that is not um, is not worshiping God. That's what religion has brought to us and taught us, that God is outside of us. It's the part and the place within you that um, knows that at your highest level, you are God each and every one of us. And when you are connected to the highest place within yourself, when you are connected to the God that you are, you have all the powers of the creative source of the universe. You become the Tao. The Tao becomes you. So, yoga, or union, is really a way of becoming a manifester. Now, in order to become a manifester, someone who was able to attract and place into their lives what they place their attention on, there are certain, you know, we saw a lot about something called The Secret not too long ago on all the newspapers and magazines and on the news and always. And um, I was asked to be a part of that and uh, stayed away from it for for different reasons, uh, because for me, manifesting is not about uh, attracting what you want. Manifesting is an awareness and an understanding that you attract what you are. Um, I have been studying in depth something called the I Am Discourses, and um, I'll share just a little bit about it here. But one of the, uh, one of my very favorite quotes, this is from Unveiled Mysteries, says, the attitude of one person who wishes to work in conscious cooperation with the ascended host, with God, should not be, I wish I could go to them for instruction and pray to God or the source, that from which we all originated, T.S. Eliot said, we shall not cease from exploration. But at the end of all of our exploring, 
will be to return to the place from which we originated and to know it for the first time. Now, the poet was speaking about dying, leaving the body. I'm not. I think we can come to know that place from which we originated and live from it. And then the words that Jesus spoke to us in the book of John, that even the least among you can do all that I have done and even greater things. It was Jesus who said, um, when he was about to be stoned for blasphemy, and he said, why would you stone me? And they said, you blaspheme. You claim to be God. You are a man. And he said, is it not written in your laws that I have said, you are gods, all of you? The infinite place within you that needs to expand and wants to grow, that which we call your life. I mean, when my mother died, she was down to about 85 pounds. But if they were to weigh her the second before she died, and then weigh her the second after, her body weighed exactly the same and yet she was no longer alive. So her life, that what we call her life, is weightless. It's formless. It has no beginning, it has no end. You can't weigh it. How can you weigh that which has no form? So your life, the thing that we call your life, is God. That's what you are. That's what every single one of us are. So here's what St. Germain said. The attitude of one who wishes to work in conscious cooperation, cooperation with the ascended host should not be, I wish I could go to them for instruction, but rather, I will so purify, discipline, and perfect myself and become such an expression of divine love and wisdom and power, then I can assist in their work. Then I will automatically be drawn to them. If you want to attract into your life what it is that you feel is missing, then what you have to do is to become like these great ascended masters. I honestly feel that I spent the first 10 years of my life in a series of uh, foster homes and orphanages. My father walked out on his family and left my mother with uh, three boys under the age of four when she was 23 years old. And so um, I had a great blessing in those earliest years of my life to be able to, uh, to go within and discover something that I came here to teach, which is self-reliance, to learn how to rely upon ourselves. And I honestly feel that uh, I'm right now, writing on a book, it was very hard for me to leave Maui and get on that plane and fly to Sacramento and take a, tri a, a car up here and, and all of that. Not because I don't think it's beautiful here, and that, but I'm where I belong anyway, so I stopped fighting all of that stuff anyway. Um, but it was um, because I, I'm in the midst of writing. And I'm writing a book uh, called um, I Can See Clearly Now. And it's sort of like a memoir, except that it's a look at all of the, what seemed like just isolated events that showed up in my life, which led me to the next step, which led me to the next, which have arrived here in 2012 at the age of 72. And as I write this, and I've written almost 50,000 words in the last six weeks, um, it's, just, it, it's almost like an obsession, because it isn't me writing. It is... Um, it is me as writing. It is something that is, uh, Lao Tzu said, <laughs> none of you are doing anything. He said, you're all just being done. <laughs> you ever have a sense of that when you look in the mirror? And you look at your body and you say, what the hell is going on here? I said, well, I got not, what's this chicken neck stuff? Where the hell did that come from? You know? What am I doing with hair growing out of my ears? And I said, that doesn't need it. I could use it up here, you know, but it's, uh, 
And you have a sense that uh, in this physical world that um, there's nothing for you to do. You just keep this thing that houses your soul in as healthy a space as you can, but basically it's doing what it's doing. And you inside of there, the infinite you, is just an observer to the whole process. And isn't that one of the things that we learn in our very first yoga days? It's just, don't be so attached to your body and what it can do and how it hurts to try to do that and can I, can I, can I balance myself here and can I do a, a downward up or down or whatever the hell they call all of those things that are out there. I just do Bikram, so it's... Uh, um, so there's a sense of, uh, of, of this awareness. So because of the time, I mean, I usually take three or four hours or sometimes three or four days to go through this and I'm trying to do this in a brief amount of time. Um, the reason that most of us cannot reach this exalted state that um, I want to present to you in, this, uh, the, in the limited time that we have is um, because we, we have come to believe in our limitations. We've come to believe in our ordinariness. We've come to believe that who we are is not God, is not divine. All right? So in order to transcend that mentality, you have to sort of reprogram your subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind is the mind that is doing virtually everything that you do. It's the mind that got you here into this room, that put your mat down, that uh, got you dressed this morning, that uh, get your breakfast. When you get in the car, you don't think about, well, how, how do I start this thing and how do I, t I gotta make a right turn here, do I slow down, do I not? You all programmed your conscious mind, programmed your subconscious mind to do all of these things on automatic. And according to my friend Bruce Lipton, about 96 or 97% of what we do all day long every day of our lives, 24-7, is done by our subconscious mind. So we have been programmed to believe in our ordinariness. I don't know if you saw my most recent PBS special, um, but um, I opened it up with a, a little story from Portia Nelson, so I'll just share it here with you if you haven't seen it. If you have PBS, you probably have, because that's about all they play. <laughs> And I'm, I'm very proud of that, and we've raised uh, close to a quarter of a billion dollars for public television, so... Uh, well, since 1999, that's just been amazing, so... So this was uh, something that Portia Nelson, who I knew, who passed away a few years back, ten years back now, she lived up in Seattle, and she had... Um, she was at a seminar, and they were asked to write the uh, uh, autobiography of their life in five, five verses, five chapters. So, and they gave them only like cards this size. Actually, they were smaller than this. Uh, they were three by five cards. So write out chapter one of your life and just go to where you are today. And um, I remember doing this very same thing, but what she wrote was so brilliant that um, I asked her daughter, if we could put it on public television, which I did on the most recent show, and, and we made a contribution to Porsche's work. So this is what she wrote down in the chapter five of her life. Chapter one, she said, I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I'm lost. I'm helpless. It isn't my fault and it takes forever to find a way out. Chapter two of my life. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same place. It isn't my fault. It still takes a long time for me to get out. Chapter three of my life. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it there. I still fall in. It's a habit. But my eyes are open. I know where I am, and it is my own fault, and I get out immediately. Chapter four of my life. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Chapter five of my life. Finally, 
I walked down another street. <laughs> Isn't that great? So what I, in the time I have left, I want to talk to you about walking down another street. And um, this other street is a street in which you have an awareness that not only do you have a physical body, but you have come to believe that this physical body is who you are, and that you have locked yourself into these five senses and decided that whatever evidence they provide for you is how you identify and define your reality. By what I see, by what I hear, by what I smell, by what my wife, by life what looks like, by how much money I have, by the stuff that I possess. And this is the world of the ego, and this is the world of the false self, according to my teacher, Nisargadatta Maharaj in India who passed away in 1986. The false self is the ego. The ego is the part of us that has come to believe that who I am is defined by these six things. Who I am is what I have. And so we spend a big hunk of our life attempting to get as much stuff as we possibly can. The Tao teaches something very different. Let go of everything you have. When I moved to Maui in 2005 full time, I gave up everything that I owned. Everything. 20,000 books, all of my photographs, records of every description, uh, furniture, all the things in the house, all my clothing, shoes, it was all donated to people who lived on the, underneath a, a bypass on, in, in Florida and um, let go of all of it. So the ego teaches us you are what you have. The Tao teaches us let go of everything that you have. Do less and accomplish more. One of Lao Tzu's most famous observations was, I do nothing and leave nothing undone. My son has taken to becoming a spiritual Taoist. Every time I tell him to do something, he says, I do nothing. <laughs> and I leave nothing undone. <laughs> but there's much wisdom in that. I could go on into that. Um, the second thing that the ego teaches us is that who I am is not only what I have, but who I am is what I do, what I accomplish. And so we spend a big hunk of our lives believing that the way that we become, quote, successful, happy, fulfilled, self-actualized, whatever it might be, is on the basis of what I accomplish, what my resume looks like, um, how many promotions I get. And so we send our children off to school and we ask them to learn to identify themselves on how much they get and what they accomplish. Your grades become more important than what it is that you are studying. What you own, what clothes you wear, what labels you have, and so on. And we become obsessed with this kind of absurdity. And we, this is the false self at work. The third thing that the ego teaches us is that I am what other people think of me. I am my reputation. So becoming obsessed with our reviews, what people think of us, other people's opinions, getting the approval of others. We talk about peer group uh, 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 you know, approval needs and so on. I have eight children that aren't concerned about those things. They were never raised with that kind of a mentality. The whole idea of you know, trying to please other people was something that they consist consistently heard from their mother and myself, that this isn't important to us. We don't, uh, we're not attached to that. And, um, this kind of an attachment. So the Tao teaches us that what you think of me is none of my business. What the ego teaches us is that what you think of me is the most important thing that I have, and so I'll do whatever it is that I need to do in order to get you to agree with me, to like me, to approve of me, and so on. 
The fourth thing that the ego teaches us, this false self, is that who I am is separate from everyone else. And so we are raised in this world of the false self, which teaches us that we have to be in competition with everyone else. We have to defeat someone else. Being number one is the most important thing, and you see people doing this all the time at football games and at bat, and you'll see it when the Olympics come up, you know, that the gold medal is more important than anything else, and if I don't, you'll see people weeping and sobbing over this idea that um, I, have to, I have to be better than somebody else in order to be fulfilled in my life. The fifth thing that the ego teaches us is that I am separate not only from everybody else, but that I am separate from what's missing in my life. The Tao teaches us that there is no place that God is not. If there is no place that God is not, then God must be in you. And if there is no place that God is not, then God must also be in all that I perceive to be missing from my life. And therefore, in order to become a manifester and to attract into my life what I want, I simply have to realign myself. I have to rejoin. I have to yoga myself to God. And the most egregious error of the ego is a belief system that says that who I am is separate from God, that God is something outside of me. We have not been raised to understand and believe that at our basic core, what, we, what Lao Tzu called our original nature, what we are is love. And all we have to do is be that and live that. There was a great Indian poet, his name was Rabindranath Tagore, and he received the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1913 for a collection of poetry called the Gitanjali. And in that poem, that long poem, 90-some verses, one of those verses says this. He's speaking of the ego. He said, I went out alone on my way to my tryst. But who is this me in the dark? I step aside to avoid his presence, but I escape him not. He makes the dust rise from the earth with his swagger. He adds his loud voice to every word I utter. He is my own little self, my lord. He knows no shame, but I, I am ashamed to come to thy door in his company. That's a great poet. And that's a great piece of truth. That in order to get to this place, we, I speak about, that Maslow t spoke to me about and trained me to think about, called self-actualization, is that we have to stop evaluating who we are on the basis of those ego identifiers and instead begin to see ourselves as divine love, as pieces of God. The Native Americans used to say that no tree has branches so foolish as to fight among themselves. And look at us. Look at what happened just down the road from here in Colorado a few days ago. What is it about us that we have to, that we have to create instruments of death in order to feel good about ourselves? What is it about us that we have to destroy each other and be in competition with each other and even create things called weapons? It's why Lao Tzu left the place where he left in ancient China in the time of the Warring States. And a big part of the Tao, something like 31 verses out of the 81 verses, speak to the 
absurdity of having weapons and killing each other. He said that uh, every death in battle should not be celebrated but should be mourned because we, it gives evidence that we have not reached this place and understand what T.S. Eliot was speaking, this place from which we originated, this place to which we shall return. From A Course in Miracles, I jotted this down the other day. The memory of God, the memory of God, comes to the quiet mind. It cannot come where there is conflict. A mind at war with itself remembers not eternal gentleness. What you remember is a part of you, for you must be as God created you. Let all this madness be undone for you and return in peace to the remembrance of God still shining in your quiet mind. Coming to know God, it's not about discovering something that resides outside of you. It's about remembering what's inside of you and living from that place. I don't believe that God is interested in us loving God. I believe God is interested in us loving each other and figuring out a way to do this regardless. And it's why I pray so hard for the idea that uh, we will have people, especially in this election year, who will stand up and have the balls to say, it's time to stop making these weapons of mass destruction. And they are weapons of mass destruction. The idea that somehow in our Second Amendment we are entitled to have weapons that kill a hundred people a minute. How far is that going to go? Now they're talking in Syria about using chemical weapons on their, on their own people. Does the Second Amendment pr provide for us, to all of us, if we want to use chemical weapons to protect ourselves? I mean, how far does this absurdity go? Anyway, that's my rant. I'll, I'll, I'll get off of that. <laughs> the, um, the way to this higher place within ourselves is understanding two very important words. These words are the basis for uh, a children's book that I've just done called I Am, Why Two Little Words Mean So Much. Any moms right here in the front? You a mom? Here, would you like to have this for your baby? You're welcome. God bless you. Namaste. So, let me just take you back for a few moments here. Back, um, back before Lao Tzu. Now, Lao Tzu was here on this planet at the time of the Warring States in China in 500 B.C approximately the same time that the Bhagavad Gita was also being created in India, the Song of the Lord. <clears throat> 800 years, eight centuries before that, 1,300 years before the birth of Christ, comes one of the most ancient, if not the most uh, ancient spiritual texts extant on the, on the planet today. It's called the Torah the first five books of the Old Testament. In the second book of the Torah, Exodus, Moses is... <clears throat> well, you know the story of Moses, but if you don't, let me refresh you. At the time of uh, Moses' birth, the Pharaoh who had held so many of the Israelites captive and enslaved, had ordered that all male babies to be born of, uh, from is Israelite mothers because he had heard that there was someone coming that could be a danger to his uh, power. He ordered that all male babies be, be executed. Well, Moses' mother 
gave birth and she just couldn't stand the idea of this baby being killed by the soldiers. So she wrapped him up in a blanket and put him in a basket, must have been waterproof, and floated him down the Nile. Moses, this little baby, was discovered by a woman who um, captured him, picked him up, and fell so in love with him that she decided to raise him as her own. It turns out that this was the daughter of the Pharaoh. So Moses' grandfather is the Pharaoh who has ordered him to be killed, but he doesn't know this. At about the age of 18, uh, Moses gets into a fight and with one of the people, one of the soldiers who is uh, trying to be, uh, <clears throat> to, trying to actually punish and, and, and kill one of the Israelites. And so Moses fights him and kills him and has to run away because he knows what his punishment will be. He runs away to the Sinai and for the next 40 years he is a shepherd. He marries a woman named Zipporah. They have all of these children. He's a shepherd. He's out wandering about, according to this ancient text. One day, he comes across a bush, a burning bush. But the bush is not being consumed. It is just continuing to burn. And he looks at this, and suddenly the bush begins to speak. And as legend tells us, this is God speaking to Moses and saying to Moses, um, I, have, uh, I have some instructions for you. I, I'll give it to you the way it is written. I just love this. <clears throat> so God calls out to, uh, to Moses from this bush and says, Moses, Moses. And Moses responds with the words, here, I am. These are the first words he speaks to God. Do not come closer, he said. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he continues, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. So God gives him this instruction. You are to go and free the people of Israel. So Moses says to God, who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt. He answered, I will certainly be with you, and this will be the sign to you that I have sent you. When you bring the people out of Egypt, you will all worship God at this mountain. Then Moses asked God, if I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me what is his name, what shall I tell them? Now, the only place in all the spiritual texts where God gives his name is right here in this passage. Same name that you have. God replies to Moses, I am that I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the Israelites, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, and this is my name forever. This is how I am to be remembered in every generation to come, which is our generation. All right? So the name of God is I am, that I am. Now, every time you use the name I am, you are using the name of God. How do you use this name? Do you say, I am sick? Many of you know that I have been diagnosed with leukemia. And I generally start out my talks by saying, I am well. I am perfect health. I am that. I am. That is my affirmation. That is how I live, that is how I breathe, that is how I believe. Now, in the book of Joel, there's a line that says, let the weak man say, I am 
strong. Now, what I want, what, one of the things that I want to leave you with here in the time that I have with you today is for you to become conscious of how you use this term, I am. I have a CD, along with my friend James Twyman, that is, um, what they did with this is, it comes from the Moses Code, which is a book I encourage you to look at by James Twyman. And what they did is they took the sound in Hebrew of the letters that mean I am that I am. Supposedly, this is what God said to Moses. And they have associated the sound with what those letters meant back 1,300 years before the birth of Christ or 3,300 years ago and come up with the sound. The sound is a meditation that I do every day. And what I recommend that you do you want this, don't you? <laughs> oh, you have it. Oh, you have it. Great. All right. All right. You got it. So what I encourage you to do in terms of manifesting, before I get into the principles, is to take out a piece of paper sometime when you're at home, and it's a, it, it sounds like a silly thing to do, but I want you to do it. And I want you to write at the top of that page the word that, T-H-A-T, -T, that. Okay? And under that heading, whatever it is that you would like to attract or manifest into your life, I would like you to just write that down. All right? So if it's a job that you want, if it's a relationship that you want, if it's a, uh, a healing that you want, if it's a abundance that you want to attract into your life, whatever it is, just place it underneath that. And come to a place in your life where it is spoken about in the book of Romans, in the New Testament, he calls those things which do not exist as though they did. You must be able to get to this place in your life where you don't use the evidence of your senses, what your eyes tell you, what your ears tell you, what your stomach tells you, what you see written down, what the internet tells you, you want to be able to be in a place where you are living from the end as if what you would like to manifest is already there. To make a present, a future dream, a present fact, you must assume the feeling of that wish as already being fulfilled. And the sounds that you will hear on, on track two and three of this meditation are the exact sounds of that those <clears throat> what those words were spoken back there 3,300 years ago. All I can say to you is that so many incredible miracles have manifested into my life since I began practicing this meditation. Who did I promise this to? Somebody? Yeah, there. Okay, stand up. Come on up. This is a gift to you. There you are. Enjoy it. God bless you. Yeah. So, this arrived in my home Oh, about a year before I started writing um, Wishes Fulfilled. And it's called the I Am Discourses. The I Am Discourses are, I think, one of the great spiritual texts uh, on the planet today. You can pick it up, especially Volume 3. Um, it's published by uh, the St. Germain Press. St. Germain is, um, I believe, because I'm a student of Yogananda, and uh, Sri Yukteswar, his, his uh, teacher, uh, who was born on the same day I was in only 1855 instead of 1940, like me. Um, and they speak about this saint that is capable, who always keeps a young body. His name is Babaji. How many have heard the name Babaji? Yeah, this is an audience. I don't have to ask that. Saint Germain is Babaji, in my opinion. This is someone who shows up in a young body. And when you read um, Ascended Masses Training, The Unveiled Mysteries, and The Magic Presence, and The I Am Discourses, which I have read all of them and studied them before I actually channeled Wishes Fulfilled. Um, but let me just share with you just something here at the very beginning of it. This I can do without glasses. <laughs> Life, in all its activities, everywhere manifest, is God in action. 
Remember what I said earlier, the life in your body is weightless, and it is God. It is what you originated from, it is what you will return to. It is where my mom is right now. And it is only through lack of the understanding of applied thought and feeling that mankind is constantly interrupting the pure flow of that perfect essence of life, which would, without interference, naturally express its perfection everywhere. St. Germain has come to me. I, have, I feel as if I have spoken to him. And one of the things that I know from St. Germain, from Babaji, is that it's only one in a million people who spend any amount of their time giving thanks to the I am presence that is your very essence, your being. Not giving thanks for all of the bounty that you have in your life and for your health and for all of the nice things, but to be in a state of gratitude for the awareness that who you are is this divine essence, this divine being. And when I do the meditation, one of the things that I say is uh, I am in a state of continuous gratitude for the I am presence that speaks through my mouth and through my body and through my writing and so on. It's staying in constant contact with the awareness that there is something divine that is what I am. And every time I use this word, I am. The natural tendency of life is love, peace, beauty, harmony, and opulence. This, by the way, is what Lao Tzu said as well. For life cares not who uses it, but is constantly ur surging to, your <clears throat> to pour more of its perfection into manifestation, always with that lifting process which is ever inherent within itself. I am is the activity of that life. How strange it is that students with sincere interest do not seem to get the true meaning of those two words. When you say and feel, I am, you release the spring of eternal everlasting life to flow on its way unmolested. In other words, you open wide the door of its natural flow. When you say, I am not, you shut the door in the face of this mighty energy. I often tell my audiences, God didn't say when Moses asked, what is your name and who shall I say sent me? He didn't say, my name is, I hope things work out for you. <laughs> <laughs> he said, my name is, I am that I am. That meaning, when he says, I am that, that was Nisargadatta's great autobiography, or biography, and a book that I have studied for 30 years now. And he was known as the I am guru in India. And this, these two words, I am, have so much power within them. I am is the full activity of God. Having placed before you so often the truth of God in action, I wish you to understand its first expression in individualization, in you, all right? The first expression of every individual everywhere in the universe, either spoken word, silent thought, or feeling is I am recognizing its own conquering divinity. The student, endeavoring to understand and apply these mighty yet simple laws, must stand guard more strictly over his thoughts and expression in word or otherwise. For every time you say, I am not, I cannot, I have not, you are, whether knowingly or unknowingly, throttling that great presence within you. So, could God say, I am depressed? Could God say, I am sad? Could God say, I am, I am unhappy? I am miserable? Mm -hmm. Not possible. And every time you say that, you blaspheme. Because when you use the words, I am, you are, you are, you are in union. You are in yoga with God. So when I do my yoga practice, and there's certain of these uh, postures that and asanas that I have a little more difficulty with others, especially balancing ones and so on. I, I, before I start the asana, my inner meditation is, I am well balanced. I am perfect balance. I can do this. I am perfect balance. And as I do this, I begin to see that I am speaking to 
this body. And what is this body? It is nothing more than something temporary that is always changing, so it's not even real. Now, there's a book that I brought here with me. And if you don't buy anything here, and I don't care if you do, <laughs> uh, I didn't even bring them. They, somebody else brought them, so. Um, um, but there's a book here that I would really love you to read. And if you haven't read it, um, I was blessed to be able to give this to my mom to read about six months before she passed on. And it just brought a, a sense of peace to her. The book is called Dying to Be Me, My Journey from Cancer to, true, to Near Death to True Healing by Anita Morjani. I wrote the foreword to this book. Mira, this love of mine right here with the glasses on, um, who just did a past life regression, who did a past life regression with me that's in Wishes Fulfilled, which completely turned my life around <laughs> in so many ways, um, brought something off the internet to me about this woman. She was wheeled into a hospital in 2005. She had, her weight was down to about 82 pounds. She had lymphoma throughout her entire body. She had tumors the size of lemons, over 24 of them, throughout her entire body. She um, was in a coma. She had tubes coming out of her and wires and so on. And her husband was there and her mother was there, and they were there to just say the last, her last rites. This was to be her last night on Earth, after five years of the steady growth of lymphoma. While in this coma, she had what is called an NDE, a near-death experience. And in this near-death near experience, she came into contact first with her father, who had passed away ten years before, and then she had an opportunity to have a vision about what her life could be. And she saw her medical records there, which indicated that she was to die tonight. And she also saw them change right before her eyes, where she had no cancer. No one in the history of the world, as far as we know, has ever been at this end stage of cancer and ever survived. That's how far she was gone. If you saw the pictures of her that I have seen when she was in that state, you wouldn't think that anyone could possibly survive that. She um, was told that she could go back into her body and she would be healed, and she was to teach the lessons that she taught here, or she could go on. And she did not want to get back into her body. It was, it was just a wasted mass of of flesh and bones. But for some reason she went back in at her father's persuasion. Five days after coming out, she opened her eyes and everyone was in shock. Five days after that, they, they were trying to find... Um, well, five, five days after she came out of the coma, 60% um, of her cancer had gone into remission. Four weeks after she came out, she was totally out of the hospital completely. Today she lectures. She was on my public television special. Many of you may have seen it. And um, she's an angel on this earth. And what she learned in this, uh, this near-death experience was that um, all we have to do is treasure our own magnificence and recognize that God is not something out there that is within us. There's nothing for us to do. There's no job for you to do. There's no, you don't have to win. You don't have to be anybody. Who in this room has, uh, who has cancer? Somebody does. Where? Anyone? Where are you? Come on up. I'd like to give this to you. Have you read this? Well, I'd like to give this to you as a gift. What is your name? <laughs> Kelly. Kelly. Um, this is going to change your life. I'd like you to say the words, I am well. I am well. I am perfect health. I am perfect health. God bless you. Namaste. <laughs> hmm.
<clears throat> they have them in the back. It's, uh, it's a must read, especially if you have anybody who is in the position that my mom has been in for the last year or two, and, um, or even has any kind of illness at all. Or as uh, when I talked to Reed about publishing this book, he said, I said, the potential audience for this is anyone who is ever going to die. <laughs> or knows anybody that is. <laughs> and it's one of the most freeing, peaceful uh, experiences to know that you're not here to accomplish anything. You're not here to be better than anybody else. You're not here to win. You're, all you have to do is just love yourself. I mean, truly love how magnificent you are. And that's what I meant when uh, um, <clears throat> Saint Germain spoke to me and said, it's all you have to do is spend 15 minutes being in a state of appreciation for the I am presence that you are. Now, one of the things that the I am discourse is taught that I was having trouble with, with this whole idea of manifesting, is written on page 318. And I'd like to give this to you as we get ready to close. The student should constantly look within his human self and see what habits or creations are there that need to be plucked out and disposed of. For only by refusing to any longer allow habits of judging, condemning, and criticizing to exist can he be free. Are you hearing this? The true activity of the student is only to perfect his own world and he cannot do it as long as he sees imperfection in the world of any of God's children. That includes the person who opened fire in Aurora. That includes Osama bin Laden. That includes Adolf Hitler. Any judgments that we have of judgment, criticism and condemnation. And I wanted to manifest something so bad for such a long period of time, but the person that was involved in it, I kept having this sense of judgment toward this person. And it wasn't until I was able to say, I accept you for what you are. It's what led me to my father's grave in 1974. And I stood there after being sent there by a series of just absolutely impossible coincidences. I stood there on his grave after being filled with rage and hatred and anger and bitterness towards this man who would walk out on my mother and her three young boys. I was the youngest. And I finally found out about his death, that he had been dead 10 years, but I went to his grave in 1974 on August the 30th. And as I walked away from his grave, because I really went there to piss on his grave, I was so just filled with rage. And and as I walked back to the rent -a car something called me back, and I went and stood there looking at this plate on the ground that said Melvin Lyle Dyer, 1914 to 1964. Uh, and something came over me. In fact, we've made a film about it, <laughs> another film called My Greatest Teacher. And I was able to say to my father, from this moment on, from this moment on, I send you love. Who am I to judge you and condemn you? You did what you knew how to do, given the conditions of your life. And I accept you for it. Mark Twain once said that forgiveness is the fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it. On the heel that has crushed it. Enjoy it. My greatest teacher. Who was my greatest teacher? After that, my entire life changed. I stopped drinking. I started exercising. My writing shifted. I went back to New York. I was professor at St. John's University in New York City. I took two weeks to go down to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, checked into the Spindrift Motel, and wrote a book called Your Erroneous Zones in 14 Days. 14 days. Today, there's close to 100 million copies in 47 languages around the world. It's, um, 
And everything in my life after that shifted. My diet changed, my habits changed, everything turned around because I got the rage out of me. Because in order to attract the elements that are going to bring you the ability to manifest into your life what you want, remember how I opened this program. We do not manifest what we want. That comes from a place of missing. We manifest what we are. The angels who will guide you throughout your life will only be there for you when they recognize themselves in you. And they cannot recognize themselves in you and guide you when you are filled with hatred, anger, judgment, condemnation, bitterness, fear anxiety, stress. You have to let all of that go and be love. Be in this place a perfect divine love. Love for everything and everyone on our planet. That's self-actualization at work. And the principles for bringing this about into your life are the last five chapters of Wishes Fulfilled. But basically what it says is the greatest gift that you've ever been given is the gift of your imagination. Your imagination is yours to be able to do anything you want with. You can place any thought in there with the awareness of I am. There's a very famous poem about that moment of Moses speaking to God. It says, Earth's crammed with heaven and every burning bush of fire with God. And those who truly know take off their sandals <laughs> while the rest sit round it and pick blackberries. It's your call. It's your call. So your imagination is the greatest gift that you've been given. And you can put anything in there. No one can tell you what can be there or what can't be there. Einstein said, imagination is greater than knowledge. And he said, if you want your children to have a great imagination, read them fairy tales. If you want them to be even smarter, read them more fairy tales. <laughs> That's why I've written five children's books with that very idea in mind. The second thing is that you have to learn to live from the end. Whatever you have placed into your imagination, you have to act as if it already already were your reality, independent of what anything or anyone else says. When I was told that I had this diagnosis of leukemia, I can't tell you how many people sent me um, condolence letters and sent me information about this, uh, about this disease and, and how it was incurable and unfortunately this. And fortunately, I was given by my children a wonderful gift. It's called an iPad. Um, and it's got this wonderful feature in it. It's, uh, it's called delete. And, uh, and then there's another feature of it. It's called trash, which is really great. <clears throat> I'd like to have a button like that on me at any time. So that any time anybody brings any information to you, you just push, tra just push the trash button. It even makes a little sound. It goes whoop. Hit delete and it's gone. I had this little scar that you see right here on the right side of my uh, face. Uh, there was a skin cancer thing there, and I was going to the dermatologist, and they were going to cut this thing out. And uh, I had a woman stop me, and she said, uh, that's really bad. <laughs> I said, what? It's just a, little, uh, it's just a little red mark here, and they're going to just cut it out, and it'll be fine. She said, no, 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 no. She said, my girlfriend's husband, he had that. They had to cut his penis off. <laughs> I said, I just got a little red mark on my chin, and I, got that, that, I couldn't possibly... <laughs> Trash, right? <laughs> you want to be very careful, because there's always people out there who are willing to send you messages about how terrible something is going to be. The third of these principles is the principle of, I call it, assuming the feeling of the wish fulfilled. You must be able to... Uh, Feel it, because every time that you feel something within your body, you give a instruction to your subconscious mind. And your subconscious mind is the part of you where you do all of your living. You want to redo your subconscious mind. Now, I jotted down for my last, the last principle. I have five minutes left. And it's... Um,
This is uh, from the book of Job. Now, tonight, I'm going to give you guys such a gift. Tonight and every night for the rest of your life, I want you to take the last five minutes before you go off to sleep and realize that you are about to program your subconscious mind. All right? Your subconscious mind is most at home when you are unconscious, when you are asleep. If you spend the last five minutes of your day, which so many people do, reviewing all of the things that you don't like and all the things that didn't work out and how terrible you feel and who abused you and who was mean to you and who said this and they did this and you're constantly doing this kind of thing with your mind, then you are programming your subconscious mind that when you awaken, because you're now about to marinate for the next eight hours in your subconscious mind. And then when you awaken, you will rejoin the universal subconscious mind, the mind of God, from which we all originate. We're all just individualized, personal expressions of that one thing that we call the Tao, or God, or divine mind, or soul, or spirit. But the Tao that can be named is not the Tao. <laughs> So you want to be real careful about how you program your subconscious mind. This is from the book of Job. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men while slumbering on their beds, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction. Job 33, 15 and 16. When you are slumbering on your bed, he opens your ears and seals your instruction. What you place into your subconscious mind as you are about to go into this deep slumber is all dependent upon what you do the last three or four or five minutes before you go off to sleep. You want to place into your imagination whatever you have placed into the I am that that I spoke about earlier. I am well. I am content, I am peaceful, I am happy, I am prosperous, I am abundant, I am God, I am God, I am God. Because at the basic core, each and every one of us are just that. Okay, so we just have a couple of minutes left. I want to do just a, a just like if you just close your eyes and just listen to this meditation. <clears throat> It's from the book, Three Magic Words. Here's what I'd like you to say to yourself at night. I know that I am pure spirit, that I always have been, and that I always will be. There is inside me a place of confidence and quietness and security where all things are known and understood. This is the universal mind, God, of which I am a part and which responds to me as I ask of it. This universal mind knows the answer to all of my problems. And even now, the answers are speeding their way to me. I needn't struggle for them. I needn't worry or strive for them. When the time comes, the answers will be there. I give my problems to the great mind of God. I let go of them, confident that the correct answers will return to me when they are needed. Through the great law of attraction, everything in life that I need for my work and fulfillment will come to me. It is not necessary that I strain about this. Only believe, for in the strength of my belief, my faith will make it so. I see the hand of divine intelligence all about me, in the flower, the tree, the brook, the meadow. I know that the intelligence that created all these things is in me and around me, and that I can call upon it for my slightest need. I know that my body is a manifestation of pure spirit, and that spirit is perfect. Therefore, my body is perfect also. I enjoy life, for each day brings a constant demonstration of the power and wonder of the universe and myself. I am confident, I am serene, I am sure. No matter what obstacle or undesirable circumstance crosses my path, I refuse to accept it, for it is nothing but illusion. 
there can be no obstacle or undesirable circumstance to the mind of God, which is in me, around me, and serves me now. This is the great lesson. Know this within you. When Herman Melville was writing Moby Dick, he wasn't writing about a man looking for a whale. He was writing about a, a man, Ahab, trying to find his higher, higher self. He said these words, For as this appalling ocean surrounds the verdant land, so in the soul of man lies one insular Tahiti, full of peace and joy, but encompassed by all of the horrors of the half-lived life. In every moment of your life as you leave here today, you have this choice. You can either be a host to God or a hostage to your ego. It's your call. Thank you. God bless you. Namaste. Thank you.